And we're back. Welcome back and happy Thursday. Today, we will switch gears a little bit, but continue on with reliable data transport. We'll talk about pipeline protocols for increasing utilization by sending multiple packets in flight during the round trip time. We'll also talk about some of the particulars of TCP, Transmission Control Protocol. But before we begin, some administrative bits. Homework number two is due this evening, Thursday, 25th of February, at the usual one second before the stroke of midnight. So why don't we get started? When we last left off, we talked about a flaw in RDT 3.0. It's a so-called stop and wait protocol. And while it's correct in terms of being reliable and guaranteeing in-order delivery, uncorrupted for your packets, it has really, really poor utilization. And what we find in one round trip time, we're only sending one packet's worth of data across the wire. And in doing so, if we look at the proportion of the time spent actually sending data, it's about 0.027%, which is horrible utilization. And so while you might have very high bandwidth link, you're only spending a very small fraction of the time taking advantage of that bandwidth. And so you're underutilizing the available bandwidth. So let's continue on. And so-called so -called pipeline protocols allow the sender to have multiple in-flight packets at the same time. And in doing so, you have more than one packet that you send back to back to back without necessarily being acknowledged. And so in order to have this, you can increase utilization, but in order to have this, now you need more than just one sequence number alternating between zero and one. You're gonna need a range of sequence numbers, and that range is gonna to have to be increased. Moreover, you're gonna to have to do some buffering because if you're gonna resend, and if you're gonna acknowledge and deliver packets at destination and resend from the source, you're gonna to have to buffer these packets. So you need more resources. You need these more sophisticated sequence numbers or range of them, and then you also need some buffers. So now we're adding to the set of resources we need at the source and destination endpoints in order to engage in reliable data transport. And so this pipelining takes on two different flavors. One is called go back in and the other is selective repeat. And they both have their drawbacks and benefits. And we'll talk and highlight them as we go along. And so what pipeline does, as I alluded to earlier, it increases utilization. And so here we have the same diagram from before but instead of just sending one packet between time t equals zero and t equals L over R, the total transmission delay for that packet, we're gonna send packets back to back to back. And so in some amount of time, L over R, we send the first packet, we send the second packet, again, the next L over R, and then the third packet. And so from the perspective of the first packet, after L over R, that last bit of that first packet arrives at the receiver, and then it sends the acknowledgement back to the sender. But during that round trip time, it takes to go from the sender to the receiver, and then the round trip and the act back to the sender from the receiver. During that time, we're also going to send additional packets, packet number two and packet number three. And so during that round trip, what happens? Well, first we get a time RTT plus L over R, we get the last part of the response data, if it exists, back from the receiver. Now, during this round trip time, this RTT plus L over R, we can also make progress in utilizing additional packets worth of bandwidth on our link or channel. Now, of course, if we're sending three packets, instead of L over R, divided by RTT plus L over R, that's three times that because we're sending three times as many packets during that round trip time. And so this stands to triple our utilization. Instead of getting that 0.0027 
or that 0.027% utilization, we're now tripling that to make that 0.081% utilization. And so the more packets that we send back to back to back that are in flight between somewhere in the network between the sender and receiver, but not yet acknowledged, we can further increase this utilization. And so that's the scheme behind pipelining. Let's look at the two different versions or ways of doing this. And so Go Back N has a window, and that window corresponds to N many unacknowledged packets that can be in the pipeline, that can be in flight at one particular time. And so when the receiver sends back an ACK, it's going to send back a so-called cumulative ACK. And so this ACK, if it says that the second packet was acknowledged as being received, that means everything up to the second packet was also acknowledged and received. So this ACK at the receiver that's sent back to the sender, it doesn't ACK a particular packet sequence number if all of the other sequence numbers in sequential order up to that have not been ACK. If there's a gap, it doesn't ACK. It only ACKs things that are contiguous. And so the sender in Go Back N has a timer, and this timer corresponds to the oldest unacknowledged packet. And so within this window corresponding to N many packet sequence numbers that are sent, this timer is going to be associated with the lower end of the window, the earliest or the oldest unacknowledged packet. And so selective repeat is a little bit different. Selective repeat is going to have N unacknowledged packets, but we're going to have a timer for each individual packet. We contrast that with the timer for go back N. When that timer expires for go back N, it resends all of the unacknowledged packets in that window of size N. Whereas selective repeat will individually acknowledge each packet. And because you acknowledge each packet individually, you have a timer associated with each one. Therefore, you're gonna need more timer resources for selective repeat. So in selective repeat, the sender maintains a timer for each individual unacknowledged packet. And when the timer expires, only that packet is reset, that unacknowledged packet. Whereas with go back in, it sends all of them from the beginning of the send window all the way to the end of the send window for every single unacknowledged packet. And so you can think about it, it's cumulative ACK, but go back in is also cumulative resend. All right. So let's take a look at the window behavior for go back end. And this pipeline approach maintains a window, and that window corresponds to all of the sequence numbers for packets that can be sent during the round trip time. And so you have a K bit sequence number in the packet header, and there's a window of up to N consecutive unacknowledged packets. So that could be packet number zero, packet number one, packet number two, and so forth. And so you can have as many as N of these numbers, and this window gives you a range of sequence numbers, and as you acknowledge packets, this window is gonna to move to the right. It's gonna increase the base of the window to uncover or define a new range of sequence numbers. And so when you have an acknowledgement and you acknowledge a sequence number and you get that back to the sender from the receiver as feedback, this is going to correspond to acts of all the packets up to and including that particular sequence number N. They're cumulative. So you might receive duplicate acts, and that's okay. But when you get an act for sequence number N, that means everything less than N up to and including N has been successfully received by the receiver. And so when you set your timer, it's for the oldest in-flight packet, as I said before, and that corresponds to the send base up to whatever the most recent unacknowledged packet is. And then the timeout retransmits everything in the window. So here we have a set of sequence numbers, each one of these little rectangles, and the green rectangles uh, going from left to right, we have our sequence number increasing, and the green sequence numbers represent the already acknowledged packets. Those are 
confirmed by feedback from the receiver with an act that they were successfully received and delivered to the application layer above. Now, the sender window starts at something called send base, and that's uh, the smallest sequence number in that range of sequence numbers. And then we have the window size n. So send base plus n is over here, and that is the bounds of the current set of packet sequence numbers that can be in flight. Now, each time you get an RDT send from above, it's going to take that message data from the application, put it in a segment, stamp it with a sequence number, and send that out down through the network layer. Now, of course, each one of these yellow squares represents a sequence number that has been sent but has not yet been acknowledged. So each of these yellow sequence numbers have not had an act from the receiver to validate the fact that they've been successfully delivered, uh, received, and delivered. And so the blue sequence numbers are those sequence numbers that can be used but have not yet been sent. So for these blue sequence numbers marked by next sequence number, that's the next available sequence number. So someone could call RDT send from above. It's going to allocate the next sequence number. And then you can call RDT from above again. It's going to allocate the next one and then the next one and the next one and the next one up to the window size. And so the white sequence numbers are not yet usable. Your system can't use them yet. And so that means you can have as many as N packets worth of data in flight meaning they're somewhere between the sender and the receiver, and they have not yet been acknowledged. And so when you get a timeout, what happens? You don't just retransmit that one packet that has timed out. You retransmit all of the packets in the window that are unacknowledged. And so the timer is associated with the send base. And what happens when, for example, if this last packet uh, timed out or got lost, caused a timeout, well, you're going to resend the send base and the next one 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 up to and including all of those yellow packets, these sent but not yet acknowledged packets. Okay, so this is the funny state machine for the sender's behavior for go back in. And so you start out in your single state and you initialize the state by setting the send base to one and the next sequence number to one. So someone calls RDT send from above, from the application layer, through the socket interface. It checks to see if the next available sequence number is less than base plus n. So is it in that window of n many sequence numbers? If it's not, you refuse the socket send. If it is, you make a packet with a checksum, stuff the data inside as payload, you stamp it with the next sequence number. You save that packet in a buffer, and you're going to need to save as much as n many of packets in your buffer space because you have a window of size n and you might need to resend. So you save that packet in your buffer and then you do the UDT send of that packet that you just created. So then you check to see if the base was equal to the next sequence number. Is this the oldest unacknowledged packet within that send window? If it is, you start the timer and then you increment the next sequence number. So now sequence number two is being used. So you could call this RDT send n many times before it refuses to send and without acknowledgement, because at that point, you're going to exhaust all of these n many sequence numbers in the send window. N will be in flight. So then the next thing that happens, let's say you don't hear back for a while, the timeout fires. You don't get any acts in a reasonable amount of time, the timeout fires. So what do you do? You start the timer, restart the timer. And then you resend all of the packets in the buffer, starting with the base, going up to one less than the next available sequence number. Now, this one less than the next available sequence number is exactly that most recent in-flight unacknowledged packet. So after you do that, you reset the timer, resent everything in the send window that's unacknowledged, and then you're going back to waiting. So another thing that could happen Okay, you could get a message back as a sender, an act, and what if it's corrupt? If it's corrupt, you don't do anything. You continue waiting. And then, lastly, if you get an RDT receive, so something comes in, an act, and it's not corrupt, so that means the stored checksum and the calculated checksum are the same, you get the act number 
from what was received, and the new base is then going to be the act number for what you received plus one. Now, of course, remember, if it's out of order, you're going to have a recent. And so because of that, you're always guaranteed that when you act, it's going to be the oldest unacknowledged that causes you to change the base. And so here, when you get the act number, this act, again, is cumulative. And if you have a gap, you're not going to get an act two if the first packet has not yet been acknowledged. It's cumulative. There are no gaps in the acting for go back in. And so that means if you get the act, you increment to the next available sequence number and reset the base. That's effectively sliding the window. If we go back here, if you get an act, you're sliding the window so that it now is shifted one sequence number to the right. You're sliding the window. All right. So once you do that, you check to see if the base is equal to the next sequence number. If that's the case, this condition means that there are no more unacknowledged packets left. So if base is equal to sequ next se sequence number, we have the base is right here, and everything is blue. It's usable but not yet sent. Okay. So if the base is equal to the next sequence number, that means you don't have any more unacknowledged packets. You stop the timer. Otherwise, you restart the timer. That restarted timer is associated with this new base of the send window. And that's our behavior for the finite state machine for go back in for the sender side behavior. So let's look at the receiver behavior for go back in. And so we have our start state, and what we start out with, there's no action, no event. It just starts in their start state. And you set your expected sequence number to one. And then you create your act for your next expected sequence number. Okay. So then the default behavior is to go ahead and send this act. And so if you don't get what you're expecting, you're saying, nope, I said this expected sequence number. You're saying, nope, I said this expected sequence number. That's what I'm expecting. If you get RDT received, something came in. Some message came in. You check to see if it's corrupt using your checksum by comparing the stored checksum with the calculated checksum. And then you verify to see if the sequence number for what you receive, that received packet, is what you're expecting. If it is also what you're expecting, well, you're going to extract it, the data, deliver the data, and then make a new act packet with this expected sequence number. And so you notice here, send packet is reset to the next expected sequence number. Okay. And so you just go ahead and you send this app for that expected sequence number that you just got, and then you increment the expected sequence number to be the next sequence number. So that's expected sequence number plus plus. And so you'll notice if you don't get what you're expecting here, this condition fails, and your default behavior is to resend that act saying act for what you expected act for what you expected, act for what you expected. And so it's act only. You always send an act for the correctly received packet that had the highest in-order sequence number. So that means there are no gaps here. And so this also means, this default behavior, it also means that you can send duplicate acts. And you send duplicate acts if you get some message or packet that does not have the sequence number that you're expecting in order. And so you only need to remember one piece of information. You need to remember the expected sequence number. And if you have an out of order packet, what do you do? You just discard it, you don't buffer it. So there's no buffering at the receiver for go back in, but there is buffering at the sender for go back in. And remember, between two machines or host A and B, the TCP or the transmission layer runtime is going to implement both the sender behavior as well as the receiver behavior. Okay, so let's take a look at go back and in action. On the left-hand column here, we have the sender. Right-hand column, we have the receiver. And on the extreme left, we have our set of sequence numbers. And the window size is N. And you notice here, this window, blue, is covering numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, so those are the available sequence numbers. 
And so this window of size n equals 4 is going to slide to the right as the base, the oldest unacknowledged packet or sequence number, uh, gets acknowledged. And so we start out, we know we can send four packets, starting with sequence number 0, then sequence number 1, then sequence number 2, then sequence number 3. So we start out, we send sequence packet 0, packet with sequence number 1, packet 2, and packet 3. And let's assume packet 2 gets lost. And so packet 0 arrives, the receiver gets packet 0 and sends ACK 0. Packet 1 arrives, the receiver gets packet 1 and sends ACK 1. Okay, so everything is good. So packet 2 is lost, but packet 3 is received. Okay, well, the receiver was expecting to receive packet 2, but it got packet with sequence number 3. So it discards it and it resends ACK 1. It's saying effectively, hmm, you gave me sequence number 3, I wanted to receive or was expecting to receive sequence number one. So it resends that ACK. It's a duplicate ACK at this point. And so now, from the perspective of the sender, it gets the acknowledgement for zero. It's ACK zero, and it gets ACK one. When it gets ACK zero, what does it do? It slides the window one position to the right. When it gets ACK two, ACK one, it slides the window another position to the right. So here, that slide to the right was because of ACK0, and that slide to the right because the base, which was 1, was received. We got that ACK1. So now our sender window has sequence number 2 and 3. Uh, they're unacknowledged, and 4 and 5, they're available for use. So what does the sender do? It sends packet 4, and it sends packet 5. So now packet 4 and 5, sequence number 4 and 5, are in flight and unacknowledged. So in the meantime, then, uh, we sent this duplicate act. It's in flight going on its way back to the sender from the receiver or sent by the receiver. So packet 4 and 5 get sent, and the receiver receives packet 4, and it says, hey, that's not what I was expecting. It's not packet 2. So it sends act 1 again. Uh, and it receives packet 5 and sends act 1 again because that's not what it was expecting to get. So now, at some point, this duplicate ACK arrives back at the sender. It ignores it because it's a duplicate from the perspective of the sender. So then the timeout fires, and remember that window, the base of it, was over sequence number two. So after that timeout fires, what does it do? It resends everything that's unacknowledged in the window. And because four and five were also unacknowledged, as well as two and three, we resend two, three, four, and five. So we send 2, 3, 4, and 5. And let's say they get to the receiver correctly. 2 is received. Three, It's delivered. 3 is received. It's delivered. Now, 2 is delivered because it's in order. So 2 is delivered. It sends Act 2. 3 is delivered. It sends Act 3. 4 gets delivered to the application layer above. sends Act 4. 5 is delivered. It sends Act 5. Okay. So... This is go back in in action. And the key takeaway is that when this timeout fires, it sends all unacknowledged packets in the window. So let's look at selective repeat. Selective repeat is a little different. Uh, it individually acknowledges all the correctly received packets. And so you need to buffer the packets as you need for eventual in-order delivery to the upper layers on the receiver. Because now, you're not ensuring they're in order or not having gaps. It can absolutely have gaps, so you need to store them so that you can assemble them in order based on their sequence number. The sender only resends packets for which the act was not received. So the timers are set on an individual packet level granularity, and this introduces the need for timer resources. The sender window has n consecutive sequence numbers like before, and it limits the number of sequence numbers that you can send and have unacknowledged packets. Okay, so this is a diagram of the window in the sender up top and the window in the receiver down below. Now, of course, we have the send base and the window is of size n and we have next sequence num. Next sequence number is the available or usable but not yet sent sequence numbers. And we see that the yellow rectangles, uh, those slivers, those are the sent yet uh, and not yet acknowledged sequence numbers. 
And you'll notice here the green are already acknowledged, so we can have gaps here. Here from the send base, we have things that are not yet acknowledged for the base and the thing just above the base. And then these two, these are acknowledged. And so you can have them interspersed with one another, but we know for sure that once you get to next sequence number, that these are going to be usable, not yet sent. They haven't been allocated or stamped onto packets. And so someone could call RDT send from above an application and then get that sequence number and then the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one, and so forth. And so this is the sender's view of sequence numbers. Let's look at the receiver's view of sequence numbers. And so here we have a window of size n, and this window of size n is the same as the window of size n at the sender. Only at the receiver, you use this window to manage the buffering of out-of-order packets. And so here, these gray sequence numbers are expected but not yet received. You need to fill these gaps in. Uh, the purple or pink ones, red ones, are out of order, meaning they arrived and they're buffered because there are gaps. They're already acknowledged, but they're out of order. And then the blue, those are acceptable. They're within the window, but they haven't yet been delivered. And then the white, those are not usable. Okay. And so when you deliver packets to the application layer above on the receiver side, you're only going to deliver them in sequence. If there's a gap, you stop. So in selective repeat, on the sender side, you get data from above. And if the next available sequence number is within the send window, you go ahead and send the packet. If you get a timeout with a sequence number for n, you resend that particular packet sequence number and restart its associated timer. Remember, with selective repeat, it's on a per packet granularity for the timer. If you get an ACK and that ACK is within the window, send base and send base plus n minus one, you're gonna mark that packet as being received on the sender side. And if n is the smallest unacknowledged packet, you advance the Windows base to be the next unact sequence number. So it's only if you don't have gaps, the smallest unact packet that you use to advance the base of the sender window. And so for the receiver, you check to see if the packet is in the received base, if it's in that window. And if it is, you send the act for it. And if you have an out of order packet, meaning not the next one, uh, in sequence, then you buffer it, you store it. If you have packets that are in order, what do you do? You deliver them. You also deliver what's buffered. You deliver the contiguous sequence of packets in the receiver window. And then you advance the window to the oldest or to the next not yet received packet, the packet that's not there without a gap. And so if your packet is to the left or smaller than the base, uh, describing those n many sequence numbers on the receiver side, you just acknowledge them. Otherwise, ignore them. Okay. So let's take a look at selective repeat in action. Again, we have a protocol diagram and we have our sender window of size n equals 4. And so we start out and we have our sender. We have four sequence numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3. So the sender is going to send packet 0, 1, 2, and 3. And again, packet 2 is lost. So the receiver gets packet 0, sends ACK 0. It receives packet 1, it gets ACK 1. It receives packet 3, it buffers it because it's out of order. There's a gap, and it sends ACK for packet 3. So now, when the ACK for packet 0 and packet 1 arrive, this window on the sender side, it's shifted one space because of the zero, and then it's shifted again because of the act one. So in doing so, four and five are now available sequence numbers that you can use to stamp packets. So someone calls RDT send from above, you send packet four and you send packet five. And so now at this juncture, all of these sequence numbers for packet two, three, four, and five, they're in flight. And so you send those out, and then when the receiver receives packet 4, it buffers it and sends ACK4. The receiver gets packet 5, it buffers it and sends ACK5. And so now, at some point, the timeout associated with packet 2 that was lost, that timeout fires, and it triggers the resend just of packet 2. So once the receiver receives packet 2, what does it do? It delivers packet 2, packet 3, packet 4, 
packet 5, and it also sends ACT2. Now, the reason it only sends ACT2 is because that was the only packet that was missing. Everything else in sequence, namely 3, 4, and 5, have already been acknowledged. Okay. And so once the ACT for 4 comes in, you record ACT4 has arrived, ACT5 has arrived, and then when ACT2 arrives, now you no longer have a gap, and you're going to advance this window past 2, past 3, past 4, and past 5. And now the window will be over 6, 7, 8, 9, and so forth. Okay. So that's selective repeat in action. And the trade-off here is that you're not resending as many packets, but the price you pay for that is in the timer resources you need and uh, in order to have a timer and many of them for each unacknowledged packet in the send window, but you also need buffer space at the receiver to store and reassemble these packets in or for in-order delivery. Now, of course, if you have two hosts, machine A and machine B, the transport layer runtimes for each of these machines is going to implement both the sender behavior and the receiver behavior, and therefore need the resources of each of them for selective repeat. So there's a little bit of a dilemma surrounding selective repeat, and it has to do with the relationship between the window size and the space of sequence numbers. And so you notice these sequence numbers cycle. They go back to zero again. And it could cause some ambiguity if the window size is too big relative to the cycle time of the sequence numbers. And so here we have an illustration of that. We have a window size 3, and the cycle time of our sequence numbers is 4. When you go 0, 1, 2, 3, you go back to 0 again. And so here, with the window size 3, we send all of the packets using sequence numbers in our window. So we send packet 0, 1, and 2. Uh, we receive that 0, send the ACK 0, send the ACK for packet 1. So now, when we send that ACK uh, for packet 1, we slide the window on the sender, and we slide the window on the receiver. Once the acts come back, we slide the sender window. But as soon as we receive successfully and deliver, we slide the window on the receiver. So we get packet 0, send ACK 0, and we slide the window. So we get packet 1, we send ACK 1, and slide the window. We get packet 2, and we would obviously send ACK 2, and we slide the window. And so that means that we'll accept next packet with sequence number 3 or 0. When 3 is lost, that's okay. But if we get 0 again, we're going to accept the 0 and fill that in as buffer, stored in the buffer, because we are now covering that sequence number 0 because we've been sliding this window. And so there's no problem here. Um, everything works as needed. But here's one issue that can happen. So again, we send packet with sequence numbers 0, 1, and 2. And we slide the window. And let's assume that all of the acts are lost. So you slide the window when you get packet 0, slide the window when you get packet 1, slide the window when you get packet 2. These sequence numbers, these acts rather, were all sent. And um, the, you can imagine if each of these acts gets lost, then there's an ambiguity. And so as we slide the receiver window this third time, we'll notice that this window uncovers sequence number 0 and sequence number 1. They're now available. So now, if you retransmit packet 0, what happens? Let's say the timer fires because packet 0 or ACK 0 is taking too long to arrive back at the sender. It retransmits with selective repeat just that packet 0. So if you retransmit that packet zero, all of a sudden, well, ooh, wait a minute, it fills in that missing zero with packet zero. And that's a retransmit, not a new packet. So if you're watching a movie, that would be a repeat of that very zero, that first video frame or set of video frames uh, that you got. And that would be kind of weird. So that's an ambiguity. And it just says you have to be mindful of the relationship between the window side for the sender and receiver and the cycle time of the sequence number space. And the problem is, is that the receiver can't see the sender side. The receiver's behavior is identical in both these cases. 
So something's very wrong, and that's the relationship between the window size and the sequence number cycle time. And so the receiver sees no difference, and you end up with duplicate data. And so that means the window size has to be less than half of the cycle time of the sequence numbers, and it's not in this case. All right. So let's take a look at the TCP segment structure. Now, TCP is defined by a number of RFCs. They're up there on the slide. And TCP is point-to-point, -point, meaning you have one sender and one receiver. And that's in contrast to something called multicast, which we won't get into at this juncture. Uh, TCP guarantees reliable in-order byte streams. And so there are no message boundaries. There's no notion of message one, message two. Each one of the payload information from each segment coming for, via TCP is considered a continuation of bytes within some stream of bytes. So there are no message boundaries, just continuations of byte streams, one packet's worth at a time. TCP is also pipelined, and it does congestion control and flow control, and this serves to set the receiver window size in response and the sender window size in response to various sense phenomena. And so the sender window size is going to control the amount or the rate at which data is being sent between the sender and receiver. And so TCP also does full duplex. It's bi-directional data flow in the same connection. So that's from machine A to machine B and machine B back to machine A. Uh, and it uses something called the MSS, maximum segment size, which is the size of the packet accounting for that portion that's occupied uh, by all of the header information in addition to payload from other layers. And TCP is also connection-oriented, requires a handshaking round trip, and that handshaking round trip is purpose with getting both of the endpoints, the client and the server, to agree if they have the resources to do this reliable data transport to agree that they can participate. Um, and TCP is also flow control. The sender will not overwhelm the receiver. And that's done, we'll learn later, by checking the amount of available buffer space that the receiver has. Okay, so let's take a look at the TCP segment structure. And this is a schematic, um, and I'll only highlight a couple of these. We have the source port number and the destination port number. That's for multiplexing both to and from the application layer. Uh, and the port numbers are associated with sockets. Uh, we have our sequence numbers. Those are 32 bits each. And if you're acting, we have the acknowledgement number. So sequence number and acknowledgement number is depicted as a index, an index within a stream of bytes, within a byte stream. We also have uh, the length of the header field, uh, and then we have a bunch of flags, like the urgent data pointer. It's not used too much. Uh, the act field, if the act flag is set, that means it's an acknowledgement. If it's not set, it means it's just a message. Uh, and there's also something called push data, which is for urgent uh, communication. And then we have the connection establishment uh, bits to do a reset of a connection, uh, a ending of a connection, and a SYN, which is uh, to establish a connection. And so those are used during the three-way, uh, rather the round trip that's used between the, the, the client and the server to establish the resources for this reliable data transport. Uh, we also have the receive window, which is the amount of buffer space left in the receiver, and it's used to slow down uh, the sender, uh, so-called flow control. And then we also have the checksum that's used to detect bit errors. All right, so sequence numbers in TCP. When we look at sequence numbers, these sequence numbers correspond to a stream of bytes. And so these are an index to say byte 1, byte 2, byte 3, byte 10, byte 100, byte 123 into that stream of bytes. And so the sequence number is that position in the stream where the first byte in the segment's payload data should be placed. And so if you have, for example, two packets, and one packet has a sequence number of, say, 10, and the amount of data in here is 2, 3, 4, is 10 bytes, um, and that would be 10 bytes here. And then the next sequence number, if you're starting at 0, that would be sequence number 10 for the next 10 bytes. 
which would be stored in another packet. So the sequence number for the next one, or the first one, would be sequence number zero. And for the next segment, the sequence number would be sequence number 10. Okay. And so if you took this payload and you took that payload, put them together, that is a contiguous tape, if you will, of the first 10 bytes, which is from the first packet, and the second 10 bytes, which is the second packet. And the sequence number just marks where in that contiguous stream the beginning of each payload data in the segment uh, should be pasted in, so to speak. And so the acknowledgement numbers in TCP represent the sequence number of the next byte that you're expecting uh, to get from the communicating endpoint on the other side. And in TCP, it does cumulative acts. And so an act of 10 means that bytes 0 through 9 have been successfully received and delivered. And how the receiver in TCP spec, how it handles the out-of-order segments, is completely up to the implementer because the TCP spec leaves this uh, to the implementer. There's no one standard for how to do that. All right. So if you have an outgoing segment from the sender, you have your sequence number, and it's allocated from the next available sequence number. And if you have an incoming segment to the sender, that's an acknowledgement. You're going to have the ACK number, and the ACK bit is going to be set from among these window, uh, these flags in the uh, segment uh, specification. And so here's an example. We have a communication between two hosts, host A on the left and host B on the right. So in this application, imagine it's kind of like a Telnet application. The user types a character, and the character gets sent to host B. And host B sends back this character, echoes this character. And so here we're going to start out with sequence number 42. And remember, this is a stream of bytes. And the ACK from before was 79. So the data is C. That's one character or one byte in ASCII code. And so that means if you get an acknowledgement, the next expected byte is going to be byte number 43 in that string because the character C is one byte long and it starts at position 42 in this string of bytes. And so the next expected one is going to be position 43. So you get the data. It increments the sequence number, and that's the ACK, what it's expecting next, and the ACK is 43. So now we get sequence number 79. Um, coming back from host B to host A, and that's just the sequence number uh, of the data that it's uh, sending. And so here you notice on the forward path from host A to host B, the ACK was 79. So that's what it's expecting to receive next. And so this is part of that bidirectional communication that we're talking about. And so it says, hey, I'm expecting to receive sequence number 79 next, and this is what I... I'm sending you 42, and it says ACK43 back. So ACK43 says, well, I'm expecting to see sequence number 43 next. You just gave me 42. I'm expecting to see 43 next. And so then it gets sequence number 79, and then the ACK for host A going back to host B is going to be 80 because you have one character, and it begins at sequence number 79. The next one after that is sequence number 80, so it ACKs 80 and it sends sequence number 43. And so that's a simple example of TCP sequence numbers. And the key takeaway here is that each time you receive something, you act uh, the next sequence number, which is one byte greater, because we're only sending one byte at a time, which is just an ASCII character in this example. All right. And so we talked about the round trip time, but we never said how that round trip time is determined. How do you set the timeout value? Because we know that it, if it's longer, it can be longer than the round trip time, this timeout, but this round trip time is going to vary depending on a whole host of things like um, the congestion on the routers, the transmission delays, the, the, the uh, bottleneck link, and so forth. And so if it's too short, that means we're going to make a lot of unnecessary retransmissions. If it's too long, then we're not going to react appropriately to lost segments. We're going to wait too long to time out. And so the best way to do this, and this is how it's done in TCP, is to sample it. You measure the amount of time that has transpired between when you transmitted the segment, L over R, and the ACK is received. 
and you're going to ignore retransmissions. And so the sample version is going to vary, but you can actually make it a lot more stable using some smoothing. Here. And so that smoothing is based on something called exponential weighted moving average, or EWMA. And what it does is it takes your estimate and it counts some amount alpha of the sample and some amount of the previous estimate. Now, typical value is one eighth or 0.125, and it's called exponential because if you expand this recurrence defined in terms of itself, you end up multiplying this one minus alpha times the estimate multiple times for each level of recursion. And so that ends up being an exponential decay, an exponential quantity. Because you multiply something by itself enough times, that's exponentiation. And so here on this graph, and this is from the book, along the horizontal axis, we have the time in seconds. And along the vertical axis, we have the round trip time in milliseconds. The blue graph is the sampled round trip time. And so that can be very spiky, right? Because there are a lot of factors that influence a delay and things like that. And it's a statistical quantity, so it's going to fluctuate quite dramatically. And the purple is the estimated round trip time. You can see that when the sample increases, for example, around 16 or 17, um, the estimated round trip time also increases, but it doesn't increase as dramatically. And so it's using this idea of effectively, you could call it the momentum from its previous value and not immediately responding to the new value. And so this exponential weighted moving average, this way of estimating the round trip time, uh, is the way that it's measured and it's done from the actual round trip time uh, inside of TCP. And so when you set this timeout, you don't just set the estimated round trip time, but you want some sort of safety margin. And so the safety margin is a deviation, and this deviation is also an exponential weighted moving average. And this average looks at the difference between the sample round trip time and the estimated round trip time. And so the deviation in the round trip time is a mixture, beta, just like how from before we had this beta is less than zero, between zero and one on the real number line, and it's an exponential weighted average. And this exponential weighted moving average, it takes some proportion of the previous deviation, RTT, and it also takes the remaining proportion of the difference between the sample and the estimated round trip time. And typically this mixture beta is 0.25 or 25%. So when you set the timeout, this timeout is set as the estimated round trip time plus a safety margin. Okay. So let's take a look at TCP's reliable data transfer. Now, Transmission Control Protocol creates a reliable data tr transport service on top of IP, the network layer, unreliable service. It pipelines segments, it does cumulative acts, it does a single retransmission timer, so it's a form of go back end. And these retransmissions are triggered by two things, timeout events and duplicate acts. And so the duplicate acts, it's sort of a shortcut to say, don't wait as long as the timer. So let's implicitly consider a simplified version of TCP sender. We're going to ignore for now the duplicate acts, and we're going to ignore the slowing down of the sender due to buffer space in the receiver, that's flow control, and congestion control due to packet loss uh, because of the routers. And so here we have some sender events. We have data in the TCP uh, on the sender received from the application. What do you do? You create the segment with some sequence number, and that sequence number is a byte stream it's a number of the first byte in the data segment where it sits in that virtual stream. You start the timer if it's not already running, and you can think of the timer as being associated with the window, the base of that send window, and it's for the oldest unacknowledged segment. And the expiration interval is set to the timeout interval, uh, that interval that includes uh, the deviation uh, plus the round trip for deviations. And so what this timeout does is it retransmits the segment that caused the timeout and restarts the timer. And if an act is received, it acknowledges the previously unact segments. And so it's up to date as of what's known to be act. What do you know that has an act? It's cumulative acts. And you start the timer if there's still unacknowledged segments. Okay. So this is the finite state machine for TCP, the simplified version, where we're not looking at flow control. 
uh, and we're not looking at congestion control, and we're not looking at triple duplicate acts. And so you start out uh, in your start state, your next sequence number and send base are equal to their initial values. And then let's say you have data received from the application above. You create a segment stamped with a sequence number, next sequence number, and then you pass that segment to IP, the internet protocol, the network player. And then you take the sequence number and the new next sequence number is gonna be the old one plus the length of the payload data. So this is where your stream base representation comes from. Now, if the timer is not running at the moment, just go ahead and start the timer. So if you waited for a long time and the timeout fires, you retransmit all of those unacknowledged segments that have the smallest sequence, not sequence number, and then you restart the timer. If you receive an ACK, you get the field ACK value from that ACK. That, and if you check, you check if, to see if it's greater than the send base. If it is greater than the send base, then you just move the send base to be that particular act segment or position in the stream that you got. Because remember, they're cumulative acts. So then, if there are not any acknowledged segments, then you start the timer again. Otherwise, you stop the timer. And so here, we're using the act to note the, the position within a stream of bytes. And we're still doing go back in for the TCP sender. And so let's take a look at the retransmission scenarios for this simplified version of TCP. You start out on host A, and this is the lost act scenario for the graph on the left. And you send sequence number 92, eight bytes of data. And so if you're going to send the act, that's 92, which is the position in the stream, plus the eight, that's 100 bytes. That's the next expected sequence number. So then host B does an act 100. So now, let's say you send another eight bytes of data after a timeout because it didn't receive the act. This does not get delivered because it's a duplicate, and you resend as the receiver the act of 100. The other scenario is the premature timeout. And here we have host A, and host A sends sequence number 92 and eight bytes of data. So the next expected sequence number is going to be 100 because 92 plus the length of eight bytes, 92 plus eight is 100. So then after that, the next one we send is gonna be sequence number 100, and say we're sending 20 bytes. So that 100 plus the 20 bytes, this next expected sequence number, that's gonna be sequence number 120. So at the host B, when we get that first eight bytes of data, starting at sequence or position 92 in the byte stream, we send ACK 100, and then when we get that sequence number 100, 20 bytes worth of data, it's going to be ACK120. And so we send our acknowledgments, ACK100 and ACK120. And then in the meantime, the timeout fires. And now we resend that first message that had eight bytes of data with sequence number of 92. And so after that, when we get that retransmitted data, the acknowledgement that comes back is not the acknowledgement of ACK100, it's ACK120. Because we know the first eight bytes have already successfully been delivered, received at host B and delivered. And so when we give the act, the act we give is cumulative because when you act byte offset number 120, that means everything up to and including 120 has successfully been sent. And of course, offset 100 is less than 120. So in order for the receiver to send this act 120, that means all the bytes before byte offset 120 have been delivered successfully. Okay, so that's our premature timeout. Let's take a look again at a cumulative ACK scenario. So we start with host A, and we send our eight bytes of data starting at offset 92 in the sequence, and then we send 20 bytes of data starting with sequence 100. So we get the eight bytes, we send ACK 100. We get the 20 bytes, and at that point, uh, we say 100 plus offset 20, many bytes is 120. So we send ACK 120. Now, if ACK 100 gets lost in its journey uh, between the host B and the response back to host A, if that ACK gets lost, well, what happens? Well, if ACK 120 gets through, that's fine, because it, once ACK 120 is received, it knows everything previous to offset 120 has also been successfully received. And so the ACK 120 is accepted, and the next sequence number on the forward path between host A and host B is going to be 
sequence number 120. All right, because they're cumulative acts. So with TCP act generation, at the receiver, you have the arrival of in-order segments with the expected sequence number. And all data up to that expected sequence number is assumed to be already act. Uh, for the receiver, you also have arrival of in-order segments with expected sequence number. Uh, one other segment could have an act pending. Arrival of out-of-order segments um, with a higher-than-expected sequence number um, is going to all have some actions. And then lastly, the last event is at the receiver's arrival of a segment that is partially or completely filling a gap. And so for the first event, you're going to delay your act. Uh, you're going to wait up to 500 milliseconds for the next segment, and if no segment is sent next, then you just send the act. And that's if you have the arrival of in-order segments with the expected sequence number, and all data up to the expected sequence number has already been act. So you're just going to delay it. Um, and so for the second one, if your arrival of in-order segments with expected sequence number and one other segment has an act pending, you immediately send a single cumulative act, and you're going to act both of the in-order segments. And so the other one is you have the arrival of out-of-order segments with a higher-than-expected sequence number. You detected a gap. You right away send the duplicate act. And when you send that duplicate act, you're indicating the sequence number of the next byte in that stream of bytes that you expect to see. And then lastly, that arrival of segments that partially or, or completely fills the gap, you immediately send an act provided that the segment starts at the lower end of the gap. And so each one of these is spelled out in the RCs, and this is just the scheme that Transmission Control Protocol uses uh, for its ACK generation. And TCP also has something called fast retransmit. Uh, the timeout period is often very, very long. And so as a shortcut to that, instead of waiting for that timeout, it'll detect lost segments using duplicate ACKs because you get duplicate ACKs because you're sending the receiver segments that aren't the right ones that it's expecting. And so the sender often sends many segments back to back. And if the segment is lost, there will likely be very many duplicate acts. And so what TCP fast retransmit does is if the sender receives acts for the same data, triple duplicate act, three of them in a row, um, it resends the unacknowledged segment with the smallest sequence number. Because this duplicate act is an indication that the receiver isn't getting uh, what it's expecting to get. And so this is an example of fast retransmit. Imagine we have a window uh, of five many packets, and we send the first packet, sequence number 92, second packet, sequence number 100, containing respectively 8 bytes of data and 20 bytes of data. If that second packet, that sequence number 100 or 20 byte payload, uh, is lost, what happens? So you send the first packet, and you get back an ACK of 100. The current sequence, next expected sequence number is now 100. So now this second packet is lost, and then you send the third, the fourth, and the fifth. Now each time you send these third, fourth, and fifth, you're going to get back AC100, AC100, AC100. It's telling you, no, 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 this is what I'm expecting next. No, 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 this is what I'm expecting next. And so here you notice you have three duplicate ACKs. When you trigger that triple duplicate ACK, it just goes ahead and resends that packet sequence number 100, which was the send base. Why was that the send base? Because you notice here, sequence number 92, it received the ACK, and therefore the send window shifted, thus making this sequence number 100 the, the new send base. And that's what it resends when it does that fast retransmit. All right, so that's our reliable data transfer, and we will end there. And as usual, please stay healthy. Please stay safe, and I'll see you all on Tuesday.